The Best of Our Knowledge explores topics on learning, education, and research. Coming up, a mild winter allows for an early prescribed fire. And we'll speak with acclaimed jazz trumpeter and music educator Sean Jones. And a push by public colleges and universities in New York aims to get more students involved in producing local news. I'm Lucas Willard, host of The Best of Our Knowledge. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. Wildfires are often seen by many as more destructive than beneficial, but many wild habitats for plants and animals depend on fire. In eastern New York, the Albany Pine Bush Preserve contains a unique ecosystem with rare flora and fauna. It's also surrounded by highways and suburban homes. To prevent uncontrollable wildfires and to maintain and restore native habitat, staff at the Pine Bush Preserve routinely hold prescribed burns. Much of the U.S. has been experiencing a mild winter, and for the first time earlier this month, conditions allowed for staff at the Pine Bush Preserve to hold a prescribed burn in the month of February. I strapped on my boots and stomped around the Pine Bush to get a closer look. The Pine Bush Preserve is known for its unique landscape and is a habitat to rare and endangered plants and animals, including the Carner Blue Butterfly. On a not-so-typical balmy February afternoon, Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission Conservation Director Neil Gifford points to a large, grassy, shrubby area tucked between suburban homes. Fire is critical to the plants and animals that are here. We would not have this habitat. We wouldn't have such an incredible diversity and large populations of some very rare plants and animals here without fire. Gifford says indigenous people maintained the land with fire for thousands of years. Today, the commission uses it to provide native plants and animals crucial habitat. We burn within a very narrow window of environmental conditions. And one of the complicating features, one of the many complicating features of climate change, is that we don't know the conditions are no longer as predictable as they used to be. Gifford says prescribed burns like these are usually done in the late fall or early spring when plants are dormant. And today, with clear skies, a light breeze, and little snow on the ground, the timing is right, albeit several weeks early. Given the changing conditions, we realize that when we get conditions that are in prescription, we really need to get out and try and burn um, areas, areas that need it. APBPC fire manager Tyler Briggs is the day's burn boss. He rides up on an ATV as plumes of white smoke billow from behind a ridge. We have really, really calm light winds today, and that's what we want because we want the smoke to go aloft and disperse above smoke-sensitive areas. So, no, everything's going pretty mellow and nice now. You'll see with the uh, igniters make it down this way, but we already created the black line downwind. This area of the preserve has had non-native plants and trees removed, giving way for native species. As a line of orange flames approaches, Gifford is showing me some plants that will benefit from the fire. A small pitch pine at the edge of the trail was brought here because of fire. The pine's cones only open when heated by fire. This little pitch pine tree is maybe eight years old and resulted from removing the black locust, opening the canopy up, and providing seeds a place to land. In just a few minutes, the fire reaches the edge of the first burn phase. Patrick Donovan is volunteering today, using an igniter to start fires, a container filled with a mixture of gasoline and diesel fuel with a lit wick on the end. It has a cotton wick, so the way it works is a little bit of the fuel comes out here, wets the wick, and then the wick is what is on fire and sets the fuel on fire, and that's how we put uh, fuel on the ground, but it's only one of many tools that we'll use. This burn is a collaborative effort between the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State Parks, and the Nature Conservancy. As the edges of the field smolder and crackle, burn boss Briggs is pleased with the results so far in the first prescribed burn of the year. I'm really happy with the way this, this first unit burned, and uh, it's a good chance for us to watch the smoke column before we move into this unit, which is in a tighter pocket. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. 
This is The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. Sean Jones is an accomplished musician and educator. As a trumpeter, he has released eight albums and has been featured on three Grammy-nominated recordings. As an internationally recognized educator, Sean is president of the Jazz Educators Network, is the Richard and Elizabeth Case Chair of Jazz at Johns Hopkins University's Peabody Institute, and is artistic director for Carnegie Hall's NYO Jazz Ensemble. On March 2nd, the Sean Jones Quartet will travel to the Hudson Hall Opera House in Hudson, New York, for a performance, but not before Sean will hold a free jazz workshop for students in the local public school district. I caught up with Sean to not only speak about trends in music education, but to also learn more about what inspired the master musician to pick up an instrument for the first time. My first experience was really in the Pentecostal church (laughs) that I grew up in in Warren, Ohio. I make a joke all the time that my mom took me to church and I was there nine days a week, 397 days a year. (laughs) So I was constantly uh, surrounded by that environment. And in that environment, there was not a lot of speaking in the church service. It was a lot of singing, a lot of instruments being played. And so I just kind of grew up hearing various sounds and in contemporary gospel music, you kind of get a little bit of everything, you know, you get some jazz, you get some blues, you get gospel, of course, but sometimes they would even morph into classical sounds. And uh, I was just influenced by a myriad of sounds for as far back as I could remember. And in the fifth grade, I decided that uh, I wanted to play the trumpet because it, it was very difficult for me. And that relationship with that instrument has been the same ever since. Um, I I love a multitude of different styles, and I also love the challenges that the trumpet gives me constantly. So it's been a wonderful, uh, successful union (laughs) for 35 years now. What about the trumpet grabbed you? That was actually the the same instrument that I... (laughs) jumped into when I was in fifth grade too in band class. But what about the trumpet back when you were, you know, 10, 11 years old spoke to you? Well, really it was just, um, it was a a few different things. Number one, it was difficult when I picked it up, I couldn't make a sound. So I was kind of a nerdy kid. I love challenges. So I naturally gravitated towards the challenge of playing the trumpet. I also love this regal sound and, you know, growing up in that church environment, in the Old Testament, they would talk about how trumpets would bring walls down and things like that. And I said, oh, wow, that's cool. I'd like to do that. <laughs> and my my grandmother, I don't even know if it's a true story or not, because I can't confirm it. She would tell me that my uh, great grandfather played the bugle in the, in the Civil War or something like that, which I, I can't confirm, but it's a nice story. So those are a few reasons. How long before it was something that you were getting the hang of and something you decided to stick with? It, it, did you feel like you just had this feeling inside of you where, uh, I think I can do this. This is really grabbing me. I would have to say because I was a shy kid, I kind of found my voice or a voice, I would say, with the trumpet. Um, I dealt with a, just a lot of different types of trauma when I was younger that kind of made me insular, you know, and shy. not growing up with a father, things like that. And when I got the trumpet, it it kind of became my mouthpiece. And uh, and my personality started to develop as I developed as a trumpet player. And other folks began to notice that. And so I like that feeling. And it just kind of stayed there (laughs) with me up until today. When you took that leap from studying music to instructing music, was there something that changed in you with how you approached music or how you saw music? Did you either see yourself and your own experiences reflected in students or were you surprised 
by how younger people were approaching uh, music and, and learning music? Um, not really, you know, I wasn't, I'm still not surprised because it's still largely the same types of things that get people into music. Uh, they're unique, outside of, you know, they're unique individuals and they don't necessarily fit in the box. And I think that's usually why people go into music. <clears throat> Artistic people are, are a wide ranging type of type of folks that you can't really put in the boxes. And so I kind of see the same things. I got into it because I wanted to address some of the things that I didn't get uh, in my undergraduate and graduate experience. Um, I wanted to address the cost of higher academia. Uh, I wanted to address the uh, sort of this, uh, this old, uh, conservatory type of a thinking where it's all through European classical pedagogy. I wanted to uh, address the fact that we need more American pedagogy and no nomenclature in the classroom. So I literally got into it to be a to be a change agent and a thread as we evolve uh, these in these areas moving forward as a human race. What methods or techniques? that worked well for you when you were learning music uh, that you pass on to students today? And uh, did your expectations change about what students would actually respond to? Oh, big time. I mean, my, <laughs> I, the one thing I, I'll tell you, my grandmother said when I was younger, and uh, excuse the, uh, <laughs> the, the colorful language, but she said that you can draw more flies with honey than you can with, with crap or, you know, she didn't say crap, <laughs> but, uh, so I just learned that, um, sometimes you, it's best to bring people along by encouraging them to do the right things versus demanding, uh, things in sort of a, uh, a gruff way, you know, you have, you have your demands, but it's a way to present that if, if that makes sense. Also, each generation has its own thing. Each generation has its own idiosyncrasy. So it's important for me to be up to and open to what they're listening to, what they're hearing, what their thoughts are. And also each, each, um, each generation has its own set of challenges. Um, I, I'm sure that you could attest to this, but when we were growing up, we didn't have a phone attached to our hip. They do. So what does that mean for them? And what does that mean for us? And so I'm constantly looking in the mirror trying to address how I can be a better educator, how I can meet students where they are while holding them uh, to task regarding certain um, pedagogical idiosyncrasies. How do you keep up with, uh, with young students and what they're listening to? I, honestly, I just ask them. <laughs> they're teaching me as I'm teaching them. So what I'm doing for them is teaching them context and teaching them what things to look out for <clears throat> and to pay attention to and also foundation. What they teach me is who they are and who they are is largely informed by what they are, what, what their influences are with one another. And so I just ask them questions. Who are you listening to? What is that? Oh, what is that? Oh, what are you eating? What, what is this thing? And they, and they are excited to be able to share it. And so it's an exchange of ideas versus me just kind of sitting there and saying, you need to do this. When you look at the status of music education in this country versus when you began working as an educator a couple of decades ago, have we on the whole made advancements in either expanding access to music education or is this something that is uh, continually or under an increased threat? I think it's both. <clears throat> I think there is great expansion. I think that we have evolved. Um, <clears throat> you know, the one thing that I have to say, man, this is a great question because the hardest thing to accept as we evolve is the, the reality that it doesn't happen when we want it to. <laughs> we work towards these things. But we are required to be more patient than ever. I'll, I'll, I'll equate it to this. It's, it's like learning an instrument. 
your mind and your ear probably is much more advanced than what your body is capable of doing. That's why you get in the practice room and you practice. Integrity is determined by one's willingness to be patient in the process, knowing that your awareness does not give you the ability to do a thing. The ability comes with practicing and creating consistency and being uh, and showing up every day. That is the challenge that we face now. We are definitely advancing in higher academia, but things move slow. Things have to be approved. Things have to be written up. Laws have to be changed. They, laws have to be created. And so that takes time. And so it's important for me to remain poised, to remain optimistic, and also to be open to working with people that I don't even necessarily agree with, but that's part of what it is. And that's why I got into leadership because I don't know, I, at this point I have a sort of natural propensity <laughs> to want to fix problems. And um, as problems arise with the, the younger folks that are coming along, because they are telling us what the problems are, it's important for older folks uh, to uh, meet them where they are to address these issues. The biggest issue in my in my mind is, is the cost of higher academia. It's really difficult to tell the student to show up when they're paying sixty plus thousand dollars a year to go to school. If it's, and so a lot of times they think if this, you know, I'm paying for this, so why should I listen to what you have to say? So if these things are much more affordable, even free, to a degree then perhaps the students would be able to be uh, a, a little more open to, to following certain uh, matrix or requirements. So those are a couple of things. But I do feel largely that we are in a, a pretty good place regarding higher academia. I don't believe it's going to go anywhere. I do believe that we have to address the cost structure. And to be frank, that cost structure is something that could make or break the human race at some point. So it's bigger than just higher academia. It is how we are going to deal with this thing as a species. And how about just putting instruments in the hands of younger learners before they reach the higher academia level and the post-secondary education level? Uh, it, certainly it all starts as you'd mentioned, in, in fifth grade uh, for a lot of people or early. Sure. Sure. Um, it starts there. It, it definitely does start there. We need to uh, put as much weight on <clears throat> excuse me, the arts as we do uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Back in the day, there's four R's. Now it's STEM, you know, or whatever they, they call it. So I'm at STEAM. So as long as the society puts more value on things that are, are, are more or that are deemed as being more beneficial financially, like the selling and buying and selling of goods, um, then, <laughs> you know, excuse me, as long as society is, is saying that those things are more financially viable, they're more, more important to us, so they're going to be a higher, higher dollar value, then you're also you're always going to have a, a a big divide there. Like for instance, I personally don't feel that someone going to school for medicine should be paying the same amount of money as someone going to school to be a nurse or to be a public school teacher or to be a uh, a musician or a painter. Right now, the society has said that those folks are going to make astronomically. <laughs> larger amounts than the artists or the teachers. So why should those folks be paying the same amount of money for their education? But more broadly, the society has to ask itself, why are we saying that the buying and selling of certain goods is more significant than these other things? At some point, America has to embrace its own culture largely and more broadly, saying that we need the musicians. We need the actors and actresses or actors. We need um, folks that are the voices of our guttural human instincts and emotions. If you take those things away, what are you going to do? Just give folks pills? 
Is that going to be the answer to anxiety? Is that going to be the answer to depression? Just give someone a pill. Sometimes it's a song. Sometimes it's a painting. Sometimes it's a poem. So, <laughs> again, I don't mean to be you know, super philosophical about this, but I think about it every day because that is why I've gotten into education. Do you have a particular song or a melody or a poem or a piece of art that you look back on and say, this was the moment, this is the particular piece that changed my life? Well, I'm going to say that it was two albums, Miles Davis' Tutu and Miles Davis' Kind of Blue. Those were two albums that I was given in the fifth grade. And my gosh, I'll never forget putting those albums on. It was like a porthole opened up. And um, I had no idea what it meant to have a career in anything at that point in time. But I knew that I wanted music to be, uh, specifically jazz music, to be a big part of my life. John Jones is a trumpeter and internationally renowned music educator who serves as president of the Jazz Educators Network. Richard and Elizabeth Case Chair of Jazz at Johns Hopkins University's Peabody Institute and artistic director for Carnegie Hall's NYO Jazz Ensemble. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. This is the best of our knowledge. Local news is on the decline. According to the State of Local News 2023 report by Northwestern University, 204 U.S. counties are currently news deserts with no newspapers, no local digital sites, no public radio newsrooms, and no ethnic publications. Another 228 counties are at substantial risk of becoming news deserts. An initiative in New York hopes to reverse that trend. The State University of New York has launched a system-wide effort to have college students produce local news. The best of our knowledge is Ian Pickus reports. Pointing to numbers showing 80 million Americans live in news deserts, the Institute for Local News will link young journalists with media outlets across New York. SUNY says it's the first initiative of its kind. University of Vermont professor Richard Watts is a graduate of SUNY Cortland and director of the Center for Community News at UVM. Watts has been tapped by SUNY to get the program up and running across the 64 campus system as interim coordinator. The State University of New York is this enormous system that has this opportunity to try and build these programs across multiple campuses. Watts says programs like this can help reverse the growing loss of local news that experts say is contributing to a lack of trust in and engagement with democracy. Here's how it works. A SUNY campus gives journalism students academic credit or funding to report under the supervision of a professional in collaboration with a media outlet. The student gets experience, and the outlet gets news coverage it might not be able to offer otherwise. These are public institutions with infrastructure, often located in or near what we call news deserts. And success is engaging more students and other resources at these colleges and universities to step up and help address the local news crisis. Lane Filler, a former Newsday reporter, is now SUNY's chief of communications. This is something that we think has tremendous value for the students and for SUNY and for the media outlets. But The reason it has value for the media outlets is because it has value for our nation and for our communities as a civic issue. We cannot allow communities to go unversed in what's going on in their civic life, in what's going on in their government, in what's going on in the lives of the people that they live with, their friends and neighbors. Filler says SUNY plans to hire a full-time director to run and grow the initiative and acknowledges funding will be needed to support the various segments of the program. The specific skills 
that come from putting together these kinds of stories, and they can be a little bit different than classroom skills, translate in a lot of ways to people who may not in the long run be professional journalists. You know, there's so much about learning how to do this work, how to gather information, how to process and evaluate information, how to edit, how to think, and being led through that by a professional that that we think is really helpful. Some students are already taking advantage of the Institute for Local News branch at their local campus. A native of Brazil, Rafael Cruvenel is a senior at Stony Brook University on Long Island studying journalism and creative writing and literature. As soon as I heard about it, I wanted to take it, so I was very invested in it from the very beginning. So it was a class that you had to enroll in like any other class. Cruvenel took part in the program last semester in the Working Newsroom course and has published stories on everything from shark attacks to immigration in local outlets. Unfortunately, local journalism is threatened. You know, we see local newspapers closing their doors. We see many news deserts around the country. And I, I think that I always studied that in college as a journalism major, but I was really never given any opportunities to act on that and to help change that reality. So what I really liked about this class was that it served as an outlet for me to um, promote change. Anne-Marie Franchik teaches journalism at Buffalo State and is a faculty advisor to the SUNY Initiative. She says it's disheartening to see new staff shrinking. Her students are working on hyperlocal coverage of the city's west side neighborhood. It's a section of the, of the city of Buffalo that used to have a weekly uh, publication. Uh, went out of business many years ago, and this course attempts to, um, you know, fill that gap. And I think ultimately this is, this is what the initiative is all about, is helping to remove some of those news deserts uh, that are out there. Filler says the Institute for Local News will be a win-win for SUNY and decimated reporting staffs. Media outlets are hurting. They're hurting for resources. They're hurting for great content. They know their, their readers and their listeners and their watchers want it. And there's not a lot of resistance to using it. That story from the best of our knowledge is Ian Pickus. This has been The Best of Our Knowledge, episode 1744. The Best of Our Knowledge is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Thanks to associate producer Jody Cowan, the latest on all national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter and our flagship station's website, wamc.org. Until next time, I'm Lucas Willard.